Okay, just a quick video here. Um, I've, de I've decided to um, avoid discussing Lucifer more at this juncture because we're still, believe it or not, early um, in the series. Um, and that would detract from the main theme, which is about Yahweh. So if I get into this, it'll be much later, probably towards the tail end. <clears throat> but I just wanted to summarize a few things relative to Genesis. I don't want to go into too much detail because those could turn easily turn into like spin-off research projects with a whole video series of their own. Uh, it could be that we go into greater depth um, down the road in future series. Um, I'm not going to revisit the question of creation. We discussed that when we were talking about Moro Bellino's book in the, in the last, you know, in the previous series, um, where he notes that when you interpret the Hebrew in the Hebrew in literal terms, that the creation of man is literally happening using pre-existing material. So in other words, he, he arrives at the conclusion that, um, he, he, he derives this from the etymology itself, from the language. Um, and, um, so in other words, the conclusion he reaches is that the Elohim were using pre-existing genetic material, basically, uh, pre-existing DNA, to create our race. Um, and from all the information that we've gathered from ancient texts, it appears that that DNA came from two sources. It came from the Elohim themselves, and it came from... <clears throat> a primitive race of hominids indigenous to this planet. Uh, okay. So, but that's, that's, that's not, we're, we're not covering that today. We already discussed that and I don't really I don't see a need to revisit it at this point for any reason. Um, until much later, if, if it happens to dovetail with other, other things. Um, but One thing I have not discussed, and that is, in light of what we have established, um, using data we've covered in other earlier videos here in our series on Yahweh as the devil, given the identity of Yahweh as the devil, given that Jesus designates Yahweh as the devil and the beast of Revelation, and given that Jesus sets himself apart from Yahweh, identifying himself as Lucifer, the morning star from Isaiah uh, 14, and given the fact also that um, he also associates Yahweh not only with the devil, not only with the beast, but also the, the dragon, that great serpent of old who is the devil and Satan, as it says, in Revelation 12, 9 and 20, verse 2, <clears throat> that alone means that we have to reevaluate the early genealogy in the earliest genealogy of Genesis. And we have to reevaluate the text in Genesis 3, which describes the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent and the serpent striking at the heel of the woman's progeny. It is obvious, <clears throat> if one is familiar with the way in which Genesis was redacted, by Jewish sages, or at least retold the stories. They may have been oral stories, and then they were written this way. I don't know, but in Genesis 1 to 2, 
or let's just say one, one through two, three, that creation account is about the Elohim or the divine council determining to create man and creating the earth. So it's using the plural the whole way through. You know, let us make man, for example, in our image. It's not until you get to the so-called second creation account, which many, many, many scholars, including many conservative ones, as well as ones that I read within the Orthodox tradition when I was Eastern Orthodox, acknowledge that there are either two separate creation accounts, the second one beginning in chapter 2, verse 4, <clears throat> and moving through the end of the account of the fall and the expulsion of uh, Adam and Eve from the garden and their expulsion from the tree of life. There's a second creation account. They either... The consensus is that there are either two separate accounts or there, there were initially two separate accounts, or there was one narrative, but it was redacted in such a way that it appears there are two separate accounts. And one can still in, could still interpret it that way, since the way in which the text was redacted uh, causes us to read 2, 4, and following in a way that is counterintuitive to the way we would read 1, 1 through 2, 3. In terms of the fact that it's Elohim at first, and then it switches to Yahweh. Which is funny, because Exodus 3, the burning bush scene where the angel of Yahweh comes to Moses, it says there that he is revealing that name to Moses for the first time. And yet, the redactors change the text such that we still get the name Yahweh in Genesis, as early as the second chapter and we get it in some of the uh, some of the verses detailing stories relative to Abraham's life and Abram's Abram and Abraham's life and his encounters with the uh, angel of the Lord um, but we have to reevaluate re the text about the serpent striking the heel of the woman's seed and the woman crushing the head of the serpent. Because it's obvious now that that story, that narrative, was told <clears throat> from a very specific pro Yahwist point of view. So it cannot be interpreted in terms of a, an Orthodox Christian standpoint. It's not anticipating Jesus crushing the head of Lucifer on the cross. That's only if you believe that Lucifer is Satan, and that Satan is not Yahweh, and that Yahweh is the father of Jesus, which is clearly not the case, as we've seen. But, as I have pointed out going through the book of Revelation, there are instances where Jesus attempts to declare that in him certain prophets, certain Old Testament prophecies are being fulfilled. And that is in order to... He embodies those verses. He deliberately attempts to do things that fulfill those passages in order to um, um That's the word I'm looking for. In, in order to um, rescue, I guess, the people of Israel from, from Yahweh. And that's exactly what we're seeing with Genesis 3. The, the author, or authors, plural, potentially, of the St. John's Apocalypse are telling us in Revelation 12 that Jesus is actually fulfilling that text. So now, the good guy and the bad guy, the roles, get switched. They get flipped. And now, the beast, Yahweh, is seen as the dragon, the serpent of Genesis 3, 
not not the serpent of Genesis 3, but he's using that serpentine language from Genesis 3 and projecting it back onto Yahweh. <clears throat> so Jesus there is saying, or the author is saying, in the words of the Son of Man who's revealing this to him, supposedly, that uh, Jesus or Lucifer is crushing the head of the dragon and that the woman is not the woman who gives birth to the tribe. You know who I'm talking about. She's not the people of Yahweh. The woman is not the one who gives birth to the people of Yahweh as was intended in Genesis 3 to be the meaning. Rather, the woman is associated with the new um, messianic sect that has broken from Yahweh and the majority of the tribe and which worships Lucifer or Jesus and his father instead. What this means is that when the text in Genesis 3 refers to the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, we are talking about literal physical descendants, not just good guys and bad guys. We're not just talking about spiritual orientation or worldview orientation. We're actually talking about flesh and blood genealogies. In which case we have to question the very story of Cain and Abel. Cain Mary may very well have been a righteous figure. This may be based on a true story that happened in the ancient world thousands and th thousands and thousands of years ago, in which the tribe came along and altered or falsified the narrative placing the blame upon Cain rather than Abel. Twyman, Tracy Twyman, discusses this, actually. She goes into pretty... Uh, it doesn't go into a great deal of detail, but she, she spends some time on it. More than a page or two. She spends a pretty good amount of time discussing this in her book on René Le Chateau uh, in France. Uh, she just has a book I don't remember the title of it now. You'll have to look her up, but it's uh, it discusses the Templars and the um, the Gnostic uh, the Cathars from southern France who were butchered by the uh, by the Catholic Church in the twelfth twelfth and thirteenth century. And in that book, she she discusses this that she believes that the genealogy in Genesis was falsified by the tribe. And I think she, I, I believe she even states that uh, Cain comes from a, one of the ancient languages. It might have been Akkadian or Sumerian. Um, that can also be spelled Q-A-I-N if we transliterated it that way. We, that's uh, perfectly valid. And goes back to an original term that means king. And that supposedly um, Cain was a king and that Abel may have attempted to usurp uh, his kingship, but that the tribe twisted that around, turned it around. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to make everyone aware of the fact that this new narrative starts to alter a lot of events, potentially, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, beginning with creation and proceeding to the fall, the arrival of the sons of God and the, and the Nephilim or giants in Genesis 6, moving on to the worldwide flood in Genesis 6 through 9, and then culminating with the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And we will um, pick up on those themes uh, next time.